Welcome, brave souls, to the chilling depths of horror in detail, the realm where the shadows whisper ancient secrets and nightmares come to life. I am your guide through the darkness, and on this channel, we delve into the spine-chilling world of Wendigo horror stories that will send shivers down your spine. First Story This story was shared by you slash inadequate 04. Something is stalking around the Santan Mountains. First, let me start by providing some backstory to the area. My name is Devin, and I have lived in Arizona for a total of only about two years, and in that time, I have found myself enamored by the myths and legends surrounding the area. Arizona is no stranger to the mysterious and I often found myself passing the nights away reading stories of the Navajo Skinwalkers, the Mogollon Monster, El Chupacabra, and even some accounts of La Llorona. Me and my group of buddies loved Arizona, and often found ourselves taking week-long camping trips up to Snowflake, Payson, or Heber. Throughout all of those trips, we had never seen or experienced anything too out of the ordinary. The only notable occurrence we had ever encountered were some strange noises that could be heard at night around the campsites, but that was usually chalked up to nerves from being so far away from the city or a prank pulled by one of the other guys. We would regularly gather around the fire and tell stories of the various cryptids and legends around the area, looking to creep each other out as we had a drink in order to add a sense of excitement to our usual trips. We had never expected to witness any strange events ourselves. This trip, the outing where it all happened, started just like the rest. Just four months ago, one September morning, our little ragtag group of six, Luke, Bobby, John, Derek, Jack, and myself worked to gather the necessary supplies for our next adventure. Luke and Bobby were in charge of general supplies, gathering tents, flashlights, and the like. They grabbed three two-person tents, a few lanterns to set around the area as well as some handheld flashlights, some extra supplies that we would need to start a fire and cook food, and loaded the truck bed with some extra wood pallets to break down for the fire. John was on food duty, and arranged a plethora of canned and freeze-dried food, water bottles, and the most important camping staple, supplies for esmores. We had put Derek and Jack on a beer run, and packed up a few cases of cores, pack of Corona, some seltzers, and even a small dose equis keg that one of them had grabbed because it looked cool. While everyone else was gathering supplies, I made arrangements and got any permits we would need. This time, we were heading to the San Tan Mountain Regional Park, which stood only about eight miles away from where we lived which was a small trip compared to our usual outings. The area was just south of the town of Queen Creek, where most of us lived, and a ways east from the Indian Reservation. The park was a very popular camping spot and was usually booked out for most of the year and was quite hard to get an official reservation. Instead of going the traditional route, we decided it would be best to delve further into the territory than the set-up camping grounds, as we wouldn't have to deal with other campers, and could party through the night without disturbing others. That afternoon, we loaded up the truck to carry all of our supplies, and piled in to be on our way. We each brought with us a rifle as it would be our method of defense. We did not bring them expecting to have to use them, but it had just become a common practice to be prepared for the worst, so they usually just sat in the truck nearby or in the tents bagged up. After our trucks were loaded up, we drove the relatively short distance to the grounds and delved deep into the territory until we found a suitable spot. The entire park was covered in brush, cacti, and rocky cliffs which was a change from the usual forests we camped out in. We decided on a spot that was bordered by some small rock formations and had already been somewhat cleared of large brush. 
When we stepped out of the trucks, it was obvious that the spot had been used before as there sat a circle of rocks that was obviously for a fire and the site was littered with abandoned camping supplies. There was trash and empty beer bottles strewn about and even a tent that lied flat on the ground. Upon closer inspection, I noticed that the tent was torn to shreds and covered with what looked like large marks made by claws. We thought that this was strange but just chalked it up to a wild animal nesting in it at one point or some crazy campers riding a high and freaking out. Who would just leave all of this out here? I said, bewildered at the lack of consideration from the previous campers. Some people. Derek said back generally, shaking his head side to side. We grabbed some bags from the truck and proceeded to clean up the site a bit before we began to set up our tents, a process that only took about an hour. Around this time, the sun had begun to set so we began breaking down a pallet and setting up a fire. That night was uneventful and was just a small diner of canned stews and a few beers afterward before we settled down to bed. Our three tents were split between John and Derek, Luke and Jack, and finally Bobby and myself. We were already pretty tired from our earlier preparations and found ourselves dozing off pretty quickly. Sometime in the early morning, it couldn't have been earlier than 3 a.m., I suddenly woke up in a cold sweat. I sat up in my sleeping bag and looked around to see Bobby passed out to my right. I was still groggy but I could just barely hear the sound of footsteps from nearby my tent over Bobby's snores. I would usually just pass it off as someone getting up to take a piss, but something about the sound of the steps unsettled me. There was no rhythm or reason to them like a normal human's footsteps would. It was like something large was limping or just learning how to walk. That is when I noticed the smell. It smelled like a mixture of rotting meat and mildew, like what wet clothes smell like when they have sat in a pile for a few days. It was overpowering, I could barely even think, my eyes began to water and I think I even gagged a few times. I unzipped my tent and stepped outside quickly to throw up. I emptied the contents of my stomach on the rocks a couple of feet away from the tent and proceeded to dry heave for the next minute or two. The smell had gotten worse when I exited the tent, and as I sat there, trying to pass this feeling of dread that had begun to build up in the pit of my stomach, I felt as if I was being watched from somewhere behind me. I whipped around frantically and looked past the other two tents, fumbling for my little battery-powered flashlight in my pocket, quickly clicking it on, and pointing in the direction I felt I was being watched from and saw nothing. Absolutely nothing. I shined the light left and right, scanning the open clearing in the nearby cliffs, and just as quickly as it had come, the horrendous stench which had plagued the campsite quickly subsided. I clicked my flashlight back off, and sat down on a big rock next to my tent and tried for the next few minutes to slow my breathing and calm my nerves. After what must have been thirty minutes, I had calmed down just a little, and crawled back into my tent and finally dozed off again. That morning, I proceeded to tell the group what I had experienced that night and was quickly met with laughter by the others. It's unusual to see you so freaked out by nothing Devin. Jack said to me jokingly. If you get scared at night Devin you can crawl into my tent and cuddle with me. Derek said with a grin. Very funny. I said back. Are you sure you didn't have too much to drink last night? Bobby, my tent mate, asked as he finally crawled out from the tent, putting his hands in the air in a stretch and letting out a yawn. I thought about it. Could that smell and feeling really have been a fallacy created by my drunk mind? It had felt so real, and there is no way I could mistake that smell. Even now, hours later, 
I still felt my stomach rumble when I thought of it. Not to mention the footsteps. I don't know. I finally said, trying to move on. The day went by without any occurrence and I forgot about the events of last night and just tried to have fun. That night we all sat around the campfire again, drinking a beer and telling scary stories, just a normal night. Sometime later, John was telling a story and Derek stood up to walk away. Where are you going? I called out to him. I just got a piss, he called back as he faded into the darkness of the night. John continued telling his story, and about five minutes into it, we heard the yelling and running footsteps of Derek as he basically tumbled into one of the tents. We leapt to our feet and quickly asked him what was wrong, running over to where he had fallen. He pointed a finger back to where he had just came from and began to babble nonsense, and that's when I noticed he was shaking uncontrollably. Luke knelt down next to him and placed a hand on his shoulder. Calm down buddy, tell me what you saw, he said soothingly, trying to get him to calm down. There's something out there. Derek cried. It looked like some kind of person or something, but it was fucked up, and it smelled so fucking bad. We proceeded to look around at each other. Derek was usually the most level-headed out of all of us, widely considered as the mother of the group, and he rarely ever drank or got drunk, so we took it seriously when he told us what he saw, but we had not entirely pieced it together yet. What could it be? Luke said to the group. I'm not sure, maybe some kind of wild animal. John said back. I think we should pull out the guns, just to be safe. I said. Good idea. Luke agreed. We honestly should have realized then that it was time to leave, but we were stubborn. We thought that we were invincible, that nothing could happen to us, that anything strange could be explained rationally. Sure we like to tell stories of mysterious creatures and occurrences but those were just that, stories, right? We each pulled out our hunting rifles and sat back around the fire once again, trying to stay calm in light of what just happened. That's when we started to hear the sounds. It sounded like screaming, all around us. It sounded like it was coming from one source but it was coming from multiple places and directions, like whatever was making the noise was traveling around us impossibly fast. John pointed out that it sounded like Derek's scream. I realized that he was right. It sounded exactly like how Derek had yelled earlier when he ran back to camp. Like his scream had been recorded and was played over a speaker over and over again. It sounded artificial, like an animal was trying to mimic a human scream. That's when I noticed the smell. That ungodly stench had returned, and this time, everyone else could smell it. We were all standing up at this point, backs pointed towards the fire, aiming our rifles out into the darkness, trying our best to cover our noses to block out that mind-numbing stench. Then suddenly, the sounds just stopped, and the smell subsided. We had a hard time falling asleep that night, yet despite what we had just experienced, we weren't quite ready to leave yet. To this day, they'll never know why we didn't just leave. Later in the night, I was once again awoken suddenly, only to realize that smell had returned. At this point I was done, I was tired of being afraid of whatever was out here in the wilderness, just outside of my home. I grabbed my rifle that was sitting next to my sleeping bag, quietly unzipped the tent, and poked my head out to see what was outside. What I saw will haunt me for the rest of my life. Standing upright, just past the dying embers of the campfire, hunched over the one of the tents, was an abomination of which I had no name for. It was tall, at least seven feet tall, 
and was covered head to toe in sickly pale skin that seemed to almost reflect in the moonlight. In different spots, its body seemed to be almost rotting, with different patches of flesh hanging loosely off of its body and limbs. As I took a closer look at it, I noticed its gangly arms held down by its sides were different lengths. One arm was longer than the other, and not just slightly, but by a few inches. Its arms were skinny and bony, seemed impossible long, and had joints turning in all the wrong areas. At the end of its hands it had what looked to be long finger-like claws. I was not able to get a good look at its face yet as it was turned away from me, standing over one of the tents across from me. I felt this rising sense of indescribable dread as I watched it. I thought of all the possibilities in my head, thinking back to the torn up tent that we had noticed when we first arrived, I imagined that at any moment, this creature could rip through the tent and my friends with its claws before they could even react. With a burst of adrenaline, I open my tent the rest of the way slowly, walk quietly outside, and aim my rifle at the head of this creature. Just before I am about to shoot this thing, I hear Bobby's fearful yell behind me. What the fuck is that? He yells. The creature in front of me whips around at an impossible speed. That's when I saw its face for the first time. It had deep hollow sockets where its eyes were and its eyes glowed a menacing yellow. Its mouth stood agape with a fear-inducing set of jagged sharp teeth, and it let out a mind-numbing screech that sounded like a mix of a high-pitched screech and low growl. I tried to shoot it, but I either missed, or the bullet did no damage. Knocking me down, and dug its claws into the sides or my torso. I screamed in pain, feeling the creature's claws digging into my flesh looking into the eyes of this thing on top of me, smelling its rancid breath almost causing me to pass out. At this point everyone else had already woken up, and the other five men jumped out of their tents in a flurry, aiming their rifles at this thing and unloaded into it, trying their best not to hit me in the process. The barrage of gunfire most have at least injured it because it recoiled in some kind of pain and got off me, releasing me from its clawed death grip and stumbled a few yards away. In that moment, Derek and Luke grabbed me as John, Jack, and Bobby reloaded and continued to fire in the direction it stumbled off into. I winced with pain as Derek and Luke lift me up. That dreadful screech fills our ears once again as we book it to the trucks. We pile in quickly, leaving behind all of our tents and supplies, and start to speed away. This thing must have been chasing us, because that scream seemed to follow us. How is it this fast? We're going like 80 miles an hour. Said Bobby in the driver's seat as he pressed the pedal to the floor, trying his best to maneuver the pitch-black landscape to get back to the trails. I, I don't know, Derek was stammering as he begun to put pressure on the deep wounds on my side as I groaned in pain. The road was bumpy and it felt like we were being pushed and pulled in different directions as we drove. The sound of the creature's shrieks and creaking metal filled our ears. Eventually, we couldn't hear the sounds of the creature anymore, but we never once slowed down, speeding past the checkpoint to enter the park and speeding trough the lit town streets. I must have passed out along the way because the next thing I remember is waking up two days later in a hospital bed. Apparently, after I was stable, my friends went to the police and the park rangers, telling them what we had experienced. They left out some of the more unbelievable details but recounted details of the creature, the sound it made, and the smell. The authorities seemed skeptical at first but were more inclined to believe that something was out there after seeing the state that I was in and seeing the damage done to the trucks. 
What I had not yet seen or noticed was that the trucks were covered in large deep claw marks on the sides and the back bumper was torn off. That's when I realized that we had just barely escaped with our lives. What was this thing? How could it be fast enough to chase a high-speed truck? How could it have the strength to rip through a metal frame like paper? Why didn't bullets seem to hurt it? I was filled with so many questions that I did not particularly want the answers to. When I was finally released from the hospital, and reunited with my friends, we never spoke about the events that happened on that trip. I don't even know why I am typing this out. Maybe just to get it off my chest so I can finally move on, but I must warn everyone reading this. Be careful when camping deep in the San Tan Mountains. Second story. This story was shared by you slash group. I received an emergency alert while ice fishing. The emergency alert on my phone went off with a shrill noise, repeating three times and vibrating angrily just as I was bringing the last of my belongings into the cabin. I took the device from my pocket and stared at it in disbelief for at least a minute before the realization set in that I would have to leave, only moments after arriving. My hands were shaking from the cold as I read through it again. Severe weather alert, heavy snowfall in the Frontenac region is expected to begin tomorrow. 60 to 80 centimeters of precipitation. Not good. I realized the roads would be impassable by this time the following day. That meant I would have to leave early the next morning to avoid being stuck on the roads in the blizzard. Which subsequently meant zero ice fishing time for me. I'd be lucky to make it home before it started coming down in earnest. Moments later, Messages started coming in from my three friends who had planned to join me. The group chat notification popped up on my phone and I opened it. Matt, did you see the emergency alert about the storm? I guess the trip's off. What a bunch of bullshit. Ted, OMFG. A generational storm is what they're calling it now. Looks like we'll have to postpone for a few weeks. I hope you didn't go through with your plan to go up a day early, Jay. Greg, no kidding. What are the chances this blizzard hits on our ice fishing weekend? I messaged back, saying I understood we'd have to reschedule. I told them that I'd made the trip up alone, accompanying the messages with forehead slapping emojis. It sucks that I'll be stuck up here alone, I thought to myself. My dog, Gibson, clawed at my leg and I smiled at her, feeling slightly reassured by her presence. Yeah, you're right, Gibby. I'm not completely alone. At least, I've got you here with me. After putting down a bowl of water and another containing kibble, my next priority was to start a fire in the small black stove at the center of the main living area. There was wood stacked up in a neat pile next to it and small bags containing kindling which we brought with us in the summer and left behind. At first glance it looked like a large enough stack, but I knew from experience I would need twice as much as it appeared to make it through the night, so I went outside to gather more from beneath the boathouse. The family cottage was a rustic one, to put it mildly. There was no running water, no electricity, and the cabin was poorly insulated. Perennially procrastinated repairs were needed in more than one place, including the floor beneath one bed which had partially collapsed, letting in a slight trickle of cold air from outside. It was drafty and I could hear the sounds of mice which had made their way in through the gaps, burrowing in the bedroom and finding their way into an old coat or a sleeping bag that someone had left behind. I sighed as I lit the kerosene lamps which were scattered on wobbly tables around the main living area. There was something about having vermin in the cottage that set me on edge. 
but at least Gibson's presence would keep them at a distance. After filling the place with a warm flickering glow from the half dozen kerosene lamps, I felt a little better. There was reassurance in having fire, and I started working on making a big one in the stove that would keep me warm through the night. I loosely wadded up some newspaper and then stacked dry kindling on top, making a teepee. Over that, I added larger pieces of wood, until it was piled up to the ceiling of the small stove. Then I lit a strip of cardboard and held it up to the paper inside, catching it alight from several places, watching as it began to burn, and then flared up in a bright, white-orange glow. Holding my hands up to the fire, I watched it and warmed myself up. Eventually I took off my boots and my coat, the entire cottage gradually getting toasty. There was no sense unpacking, I thought, taking a beer out of the cooler and opening it. I took a sip and couldn't help but grimace at the taste. I'd never tried the brand before and I'd picked it up on a recommendation. It was awful. And lukewarm to boot. Par for the course considering the trip so far. I took out my phone and watched Netflix while the beer went flat beside me. I lifted Gibson up onto the futon with me, so that she was off the floor, and close to the fire where it was warm. Eventually I got bored of office reruns and called it a night, adding another log to the fire and reminding myself to wake up in an hour to keep it going. Pulling the futon even closer to the stove so that it was as close to the fire as safety would allow, I curled up in my sleeping bag and drifted off into an uncomfortable slumber, constantly tossing and turning, trying to stay warm but not succeeding. I woke up to the sound of whining coming from Gibson trembling on the bed beside me. I was so cold that I was actually scared. My teeth were chattering uncontrollably and I realized a few hours had passed. The fire had gone out completely, reduced to mere embers at the base of the stove. I put on my jacket and blew hot breath onto my fingers, pulling Gibson closer to me. She was shaking badly as well. My hands were trembling as I put more newspaper and kindling onto the fire, blowing into the embers and hoping they would reignite. My lungs felt frozen and my heart was beating fast, my skin prickling with pins and needles turning into total numbness in my extremities. I'd never felt so cold in my life, and realized it was far beyond the weather forecasted on the news. It seemed like it was minus 30 degrees, and steadily dropping further. Terrified that I would not be able to get my body temperature back up, my mind started racing, thinking of worst-case scenarios. If I couldn't stop shaking pretty soon, it would be impossible to start a fire again. I recalled that my truck was just outside, and I could get in there and start it up, turning on the heat until I felt warm again. But the idea of getting out there and the truck refusing to start was too much to take. And considering the state of the beat-up old Ford, that seemed like a distinct possibility. So I continued stoking the fire, blowing on the precious few embers and adding more newspaper every so often, until a tiny flame had begun to grow. I held my shaking hands up to the measly fire and added pieces of kindling sparingly, one by one, terrified of it going out again. Pulling Gibson closer, we shared each other's warmth and I began to feel half-human again. A sound came from outside the cabin suddenly, startling me and causing me to jump, my heart skipping a beat then pounding faster and faster in my chest. A noise like fingernails being dragged across the siding could be heard from all around, echoing in the small space. Something was going from one end of the cottage to the other, attempting to get inside. Deep, guttural breathing could be heard, grunting and snorting, desperate as it scraped its talons against the boarded-up windows. Gibson began to whine, making high-pitched noises as she huddled closer to me, 
and I put my hand over her muzzle, muffling her sounds. Was it a bear? I wondered, and realized I was holding my breath. I thought about the holes in the flimsy facade of the cabin. The spot beneath the bed where mice were getting in. I thought about the broken screen door and the wooden one behind that which needed to be replaced, almost falling off its rusty hinges. The entire cottage felt so frail and insecure all of a sudden, as I heard the loud noise of whatever that thing was, breathing heavily just outside, trying to get in. Maybe it was too cold out there even for it. The ground shook with the weight of the creature as it made its way around the cabin. I was so focused on it that I didn't notice the fire going out again at first, as it fizzled down to embers. I continued holding my breath until it was gone. And then I relit the fire, my shaking hands barely able to get it going again. Once it was burning hot I didn't sleep anymore. I pulled Gibson close and the two of us stayed up all night watching the fire with weary eyes, taking occasional glances at the door. Even once we were both warm, we continued to shiver. When the sun came up I didn't notice at first. It was dark in the cottage one minute and then it was light. I blinked my eyes a few times and rolled out of bed, deciding I would waste no more time before leaving. I just hoped the bear or whatever had been outside the night before was gone. Gibson was scratching at the front door, asking to be let outside to pee, which told me it was probably safe now. In the light of the morning all that had happened seemed like a bad nightmare, and I told myself maybe it had been. Until I got outside and saw the claw marks which marred the exterior walls. Shuddering, I threw my belongings in the truck, doused the fire with too much water, and took one last look at the place. What a shitty weekend this turned out to be, I thought to myself. With more people around it was easier to keep the fire going, taking turns feeding it with wood so that everyone could sleep through the night. But it was frightening being up here by myself, even with Gibson by my side. I'd never done it before in the winter and I never would again. There were too many things that could go wrong. A freak snowstorm, a fallen tree blocking the road, getting stuck or going into a ditch, and those were just the beginning. I wanted to get out of here before any of those things happened. The truck didn't want to start at first. I turned the key in the ignition twice, hearing only a click and the absence of any engine noise. Cursing loudly, I checked to make sure I hadn't left an interior light on, or something which could have drained the battery. Satisfied there was still a charge, I tried one more time, and finally the old shitbox let out a cough and kicked into life. The engine began to sputter, before finally settling into a steady, rusted purr. All right, Gibson. Let's get out of here, I said, rubbing the dog's head and smiling as she blinked her eyes. She looked content in the front seat, happy to be back in the truck and out of the old cottage. There was a thin layer of snow on the gravel road, and the tires got moving easily enough. I looked up to see the sky was turning grey above me, and a few white flakes were just beginning to fall. The weather was making an early appearance. I turned on the radio and sure enough they said the same thing I was thinking. The storm would be arriving early. By noon, the highway would be a parking lot. Whiteout conditions. Be prepared to be trapped in your car. Have emergency supplies ready. My anxiety was through the roof as I went around a bend in the road. Hitting the gas, I came to the first big hill and went over it, seeing something strange up ahead as I came over the rise. Whatever it was, it was blocking the road. Massive and brown, the lumpy, furry shape got bigger as I pulled up in front of it. The bear which had been trying to get into my cottage the night before was dead. 
lying in the middle of the gravel road and blocking it completely. At first I thought it had frozen to death. I got out of my truck to inspect it and was surprised to find there was a horrible smell coming from the carcass. It was a chemical smell, noxious and unpleasant, like some sort of factory waste. The snow had melted all around the beast, and blood and entrails were pooling around the far side. What the hell could do such a thing? Aren't bears at the top of the food chain? Alpha predators. Gibson was by my side, but she did not venture near the body. Usually she would be curious, trying to sniff at something like that, but she stayed next to me, emitting a low growl. The road was completely blocked, I realized. There was no way out. Not unless I could move it. But no matter which way I attempted it, the giant body of the dead bear would not budge. It weighed a ton. There were large trees on either side of the road, too close to drive past. There was only one other way out, which was by driving across the frozen lake, and that way was risky. I hadn't been able to test the thickness of the ice yet. It would need to be nearly a foot deep for me to feel comfortable. But there was a clear way on and off the ice, if it came down to it. I got back in the truck and threw it in reverse, since there was nowhere to turn around. I felt sick to my stomach, nervous with anticipation and fear, uncertain of how I was going to get out of here. Once back in front of the cottage, I got out of the truck and went down to the ice with my spot. Walking out onto the lake, I cleared a spot with my boot and began to dig with the sharpened metal rod. Satisfied that I'd found the bottom of the ice, I put the tape measure through the hole, hoping it would be close to a foot. Looking at the tape measure, my heart sank. The ice was barely seven inches thick. Just below the minimum eight inches where it would be safe to drive a vehicle across. And my truck was on the heavier side, I would feel more comfortable if it was a full foot thick or more. I pulled out my phone and checked for a signal, deciding it was time to call someone for help. Who I would call, I still wasn't sure, but I knew I couldn't get out of this jam by myself. Of course, I muttered out loud, seeing the signal bar was down to zero, and the words, N.O. Service, were printed across the top of the screen. Surely I would have gotten another severe weather alert by now. I realized, had it not been for the total lack of cell signal. Because snow was now being dumped down on me from above, and the sky had turned nearly black with the approaching storm. I typed out a message in the group chat, telling them my situation, hitting send regardless of the lack of signal. I knew from experience that it would go through eventually. I just hoped it would be sooner rather than later. Gibson let out a loud, high-pitched whine. Her tone rose in volume and she began to bark. High, persistent yips that were totally unlike her. She backed away, then let out a stream of urine, her hind legs trembling as she did. I looked up from my phone and saw what her eyes had spotted. Across the lake, something was moving in the trees. I saw fingers wrapping around a tree trunk, too high up, the nails too long and too sharp to be a person's. Whatever this giant was, it looked similar to a man, but it was massive. It peered out at me from between the boughs of trees, its head probably fifteen feet off the ground. Its skeletal limbs matched the monochromatic tone of the birches on either side of it, a grey, pale white shade. I couldn't distinguish the entire form of it in the shadows, but I could make out its eyes. They reflected back at me, catching the grey light coming through the clouds. And then I saw its mouth spread wider in a grin, teeth dripping blood, and it disappeared back into the darkness. 
The temperature felt like it had dropped to 30 below freezing again, as I began to shiver involuntarily and looked down to see Gibson was doing the same. There was only one choice. Only one place where we could go. The cabin. It was either that or risk plunging the truck into a frozen lake, attempting to drive across. We were on a small peninsula, surrounded by water on all sides, only one way in or out. And that way was blocked by the body of a giant brown bear. I took the dog back inside the cottage and locked the doors, taking uneasy glances outside through the cracks in the boarded up windows. What the hell was that thing in the forest? I asked myself over and over again. But no answer would come to mind. There was no creature I could think of that was fifteen feet tall, with reflective eyes, which stood on two legs like a man. Capable of disemboweling a full-grown bear. Capable of causing the temperature to plunge all around me. There was only one creature capable of that. And it wasn't supposed to exist. It was something from myth and from folklore, from legends that aren't supposed to be real. It's a wendigo, I said aloud, immediately regretting the words, as if saying them made it true. As if saying them would summon it. Wendigos are supernatural creatures born of Canadian First Nations folklore. They live in cold, remote places, and make people go mad merely through their presence. They thrive on the hunger, despair, and loneliness of their victims, who usually live in remote communities. They drive families apart, instilling urges of cannibalism in people and making them want to consume their own loved ones, during the lean, hard months of winter. They turn people into raving cannibals, driving away all their loved ones. And then, once you're alone, the Wendigo strikes. It either consumes you while you're still alive, tearing the flesh from your bones while you beg and scream, or it turns you into one of its own kind. But the Wendigo's greatest curse is that no matter how much flesh it consumes, it only grows hungrier. With every ounce of meat it takes in, it grows taller and more emaciated. Its hunger grows more insatiable with its height, until it is a towering beast with its head amongst the treetops as it roams the forest, constantly searching for its next meal. Gibson whimpered and burrowed her face into my armpit, as if hearing my inner thoughts. Trying to reassure her, I stroked her fur and told her it would be okay, although I had a feeling it wouldn't be. I tried to get the fire going again, but it was a fruitless effort. Everything inside the stove was damp and wet, and I scolded myself for dousing the fire with so much water. Still, I kept at it, knowing we might be stuck there for a while. Pretty soon the wind was howling and blowing outside and the snow was piling up in front of the door. I made a point of opening it every so often and clearing the front steps, knowing that I would need firewood, taking weary glances off into the forest across the lake as I did so. Finally I got the fire started, a low, guttering flame in the stove which wanted to go out all the time. Everything was damp but I kept feeding fresh kindling into it, nursing it until it kept going by itself. Hours passed as we waited to either run out of firewood or be attacked by the creature. We were running low on kindling and the sun was beginning to set, my stomach rumbling with hunger, when I felt something strange. The ground was suddenly shaking beneath my feet and I heard Gibson whining from beside me. What is it, girl? I asked, my voice catching in my throat as I realized the answer. It was the creature. It was back. The dining table began to rattle and bounce up and down as whatever was outside got closer, and I imagined the huge creature lifting the roof from the cabin like the cloche on a dish in a fancy restaurant, picking me up and eating me whole, like a wriggling shrimp. 
A second later there was a sound at the front door of metal being ripped and sheared as I realized the creature was making its way in. The screen door landed on the ground with a crash and then the wooden door was being torn from its hinges an instant later. Cold air rushed inside as Gibson began to let out shrill, panicked barks of terror. I heard the thing tearing apart the front entrance, easily ripping apart the wood and making the doorway larger so that it could come inside. I tipped over the dining room table to use it as a barricade. I picked up a chair, the only weapon I could find nearby, thinking I would throw it at the thing's face to defend us, when I heard a strange noise from out front. It was a car horn honking. Someone had come to save me. I heard a loud ding and pulled out my phone and saw the green check mark beside my group chat message, indicating at some point it had gone through, at some brief moment when there'd been a gap in the clouds. Reading the one new received message on my phone, a hopeful smile spread across my face. Matt, you just had to skip town a day early and go ice fishing, didn't you? What the hell is that thing? Ted was yelling from outside. I don't know, but it's trying to get inside. Jay! Are you there? I shouted back that I was. There was a loud screech from outside which I realized had come from the monster. They'd actually wounded it somehow. I ran to the front door with Gibson and looked up seeing the creature for the first time. It stood with its back to us, its head among the treetops, even taller than it had appeared at first. My friends had caught it off guard, but now it was fully aware of them, and it was going after them. The Wendigo was distracted by something in front of the cottage and I realized one of my friends had gotten out of the car and they were using themselves as bait, so that I could flee the cottage safely. They had driven across the ice with their lighter vehicle, just as I had hoped to do. I guessed that they'd also run into trouble moving the body of the giant bear which blocked the road. J. Ted screamed out the window, driving the car in circles on the ice, as if too terrified to stay still. I raced over to the car, slipping and sliding on the lake ice. It was Matt who was distracting the Wendigo, I realized, and I called for him to get away from the thing. It was too large and too fast. He didn't know what he was dealing with, but that was Matt. He was always the act first, think later type. Not only that, but he often put himself in harm's way for his friends. He turned to look at me and gave a thumbs up, his attention diverted from the creature for a split second too long. As Gibson and I got into the car, we heard his screams, and I looked to see the Wendigo had closed the distance in an instant, and was picking him up like an insect, turning him and taking bites from him in places. As Matt screamed for help, the creature peeled off his skin, exposing his skull as he ate his face. The calls for help turned to bubbling gurgles and wet, choked sounds and I nearly got out of the car to run after him, but Ted grabbed my wrist and pulled me back inside. You can't save him, he said with wet, red-rimmed eyes, and eventually I relented. We raced away across the icy lake, making a path through the blizzard, cutting a swath out of the fresh fallen snow on our way back to the main roads. For a while we debated what to do. Should we call the police? Our friend had just died after all. But we knew that if we did we would be considered suspects. And with no other reasonable explanation, they would pin the death on us. They would say we killed him. There was no box you could check on an official police report, citing a Wendigo attack, after all. Such things didn't exist. They were myths. Legends. As it turned out, we wouldn't have to worry about it. 
A message popped up from Matt on the group chat just a few minutes after we got home, and I had to tell myself it wasn't all just a nightmare, hallucination from the cold and from lack of sleep and food. But Ted and Greg both told me I hadn't imagined it. What we saw was real. As much as I wish it wasn't. The three of us read the message on the group chat again and again. My heart was beating fast and a sick knot was growing in my stomach, bile rising in my throat that I could taste inside my mouth. Matt, hey guys, you really missed out on a feast. Ice fishing is just as much fun in a blizzard, if not more. Let's reschedule the trip for next weekend, okay? I'll be waiting for you here. As much as we don't want to go, we've resolved that we have to. We can't leave Matt like that. We have to help him. Next weekend we're making the trip back up there. Even if it kills us. Third story. This story was shared by you slash resident safe 771. My parents went hiking three days ago, the search party found their GoPro still recording. It was sudden, we got a call from a nearby city's police station, our uncle who was taking care of me and my sister while our parents were away answered the phone. We were confused as to why our uncle was crying until we learned the news, our parents were found dead over 11 miles away from where they started hiking over three days ago. I was horrified, I felt as if my world has just splintered into nothing, and my sister just fell to the floor while I just sat there, blank face and warm tears running down my cheeks. The sheriff was obligated to ask us where we wanted the funeral, and other questions, thankfully my uncle pulled himself together and scheduled his own brother and sister-in-law's funeral by himself. The weeks flew by as the weekend was over and I was left in a well of grief, still processing all that had recently happened. Eventually, we got another call, telling us that another piece of evidence had been found, we initially dismissed it, until they told us that it belonged to our parents. As they told us, the more intrigued we were, until my uncle decided to drive us all down there, after all, all of us at least wanted to see their faces one more time, since mysteriously, the funeral was closed casket. Once we got there we waited in the waiting room until a man guided us in, they said they had not yet reviewed the footage, and that when they found it, it was covered in blood and still recording even though it was clearly damaged. Finally, we got to a room where they were ready to play the footage, and all of us took a seat before the man who led us in started the video. At first, it was just my parents walking, we fast forwarded, more walking, some fishing, picking up sticks and skipping rocks. I was simply happy to see my parents again, even if it was just a recording. We went to the next video, my parents were just walking, but looked noticeably tired and anxious. Eventually, while they were resting, my mother broke the silence, did you hear any of that last night? My father responded, yeah, it sounded so odd, like it was directly in my ear, but also near a mile away, she gave him an agreeing nod. Eventually they kept walking, not breaking the silence until they camped, do you think it will happen again? My mother asked, my father responded, it had to have been just some animal, no creature would follow us that far just to make some noises and not do anything to us, but what if it dash, my mother was cut off, just trust me, we'll leave tomorrow and forget any of this happened, my father tried to reassure her, it worked and they went to bed. On the third day though, something was off, my mother no longer had her bright energy accompanying her, and my father seemed to be suffering from sleep deprivation. It felt as though my parents were just husks of their former selves. And more ominous than that, there was a strange, faint background noise constantly playing for the first three hours. Then it just stopped, my parents looked around and seemed to sigh and become way more relaxed, 
then they stopped for a food break at a small creek. It seemed good, until that noise started back up, and louder than before, this caused notable dread in my parents, as the fear in their eyes was visible. They both ran away, leaving all their food behind, as the noise kept getting louder. Eventually, my mother tripped and her bone-chilling screams could be heard in the background as the noise seemed to stop with her. After two hours of non-stop running, my father ended up at our house backyard. I heard him sobbing uncontrollably, he was a mess just by the audio. He started to get it together and approach our house, until the light around him seemed to wash away, like fresh paint in reaction to water. We sat there watching this overwhelming silence and darkness, until it was broken by a faint sound, then it got louder, and louder, until it felt like my eardrums were about to pop. My father appeared back in the woods, but he was not alone, as he turned, a part of the screen seemed to warp and glitch out, my father looked at it, and started screaming as the thing approached him in the blink of an eye. My father seemed to be screaming as something was inserted into his mouth, then it stopped when the snapping of his bones was heard. The GoPro fell onto the ground, and it filmed my father floating over the glitching part of the screen, then both of them just seemed to phase out of focus, and into nothingness. I was in shock by what I saw, and so was everyone else in the room with me. My sister was pale, and my uncle looked completely petrified. Finally, the police escorted us out. The drive home was silent, and we all seemed to not dare to speak a word, because, in the silence, we all heard it. The faint sound, of the thing that killed my parents, slowly approaching. Fourth Story This story was shared by you slash drblackjack21. My girlfriend took me camping. I just want to start by saying that dating is hard. Once you get past all the bots, ads, and scammers and meet a real person, the guessing game begins. Why is this person actually available right now? Are they really just down on their luck, or is it something else that you're happier not knowing? Then, once you figure out their deep dark secrets, the question becomes, are they willing to put up with your deep dark secrets? This process can take weeks to sort out, usually resulting in a dead end somewhere, forcing you to start over. The whole thing is frustrating, demeaning, and humiliating enough that you're physically and emotionally exhausted, making you just want to give up and be a loner. Now I know what you're wondering. What's this got to do with anything? Well, it's kind of simple. A little bit ago, I wrote about how my girlfriend, Wendy, never eats and that I heard some unsettling things at her house the last time I visited. Well, I decided to keep seeing Wendy. Sure, she might have some unusual habits, but she makes me feel good about myself, and I'm happy with her. So what if she never eats or chases off bears while nude in the middle of the night? Compared to returning to the dating scene, that's really not so bad. We even have nicknames for each other now, Country Girl and City Boy. I'll let you guess which is which. Anyway, that's a rather long and roundabout way of saying that, yeah, I went on that camping trip with her, and things didn't go quite how I expected. First off, I wanna say that she was right. The forest really is beautiful. The sun's heat, combined with the coolness of the shade, while listening to the insects drone lazily in the background, seems to slow time to a crawl, making each breath a relaxing experience in and of itself. It's entirely unlike anything you'll experience during your morning commute. Combine all that with the right company, and soon you'll wonder why you'd ever return. And let me tell you, Wendy is 100% the right company. Wendy was quick with tips to make the hike easier, 
from how to properly distribute your pack load to how to lace your shoes for maximum comfort. During the trek to where we were going to set up camp, she alternated between offering interesting bits of information about the local flora and fauna and walking in silence, allowing me to get lost in the experience. The whole affair made me want to give up the city life and move to the country. There was just one thing during the walk that wasn't as pleasant as everything else. At one point, we must have walked too close to a skunk or a rotting carcass or something because the whole area around us started to reek. At first, it wasn't so bad, but eventually, it got so strong it made me want to gag. I jokingly mentioned it to Wendy, but she just looked ahead like she was determined and told me, pick up the pace. We'll be past it soon enough. Sure enough, we eventually got past the smell, and things quickly became pleasant again. The rest of the hike passed without incident, and Wendy even helped me set up the tent. Her evident experience in the matter showed through because it took no time. Soon enough, everything was ready, and we even had a nice, cheerful fire roaring. This time, when she pulled out the supplies for dinner, I didn't even bat an eye when it was clearly only enough for one. Whatever was going on with her, this was just the way it was going to be. It was up to me to accept that or move on, and I'd made my call. But I have to say, for someone who never seems to eat, she sure knows how to sear a steak to perfection. After a pleasant evening and an even more pleasant night, we passed out in the tent together while listening to the crickets and the more distant owls. But of course, if that's all that happened, I wouldn't be writing about it here. Sometime during the night, I awoke to find I was alone in the tent. This wasn't too unexpected because Wendy was both an outdoor enthusiast and a bit of a night owl. I debated calling out to her, but something in the air felt like I shouldn't disturb it with such an out-of-place sound. However, Mother Nature did have her demands, and it was time to answer her call. As I unzipped the tent and stepped out, I couldn't help but look up into the night sky. The stars were breathtaking. You never see this many this vibrant in the city. However, their beauty couldn't distract me for long in the face of more, urgent demands. Do you know that feeling when you've been holding it in a little too long and finally experience relief? If it weren't for my experiences earlier that night, I might be tempted to claim it is better than sex, but we'll just say it was still pretty euphoric. Maybe it distracted me from the fact that all the usual night sounds had suddenly gone quiet, but it couldn't distract me from the sudden smell of rotting flesh. It was even stronger than it had been on the trail and was accompanied by the kind of fear that you usually feel when you're very young and just starting to wonder if there might be reason sounds go bump in the night. I gagged as I struggled to cut off the stream, zip up my pants, and retreat into the tent again. Once in the tent, I reached for the flashlight, then hesitated. I desperately wanted to see better, but something in the back of my mind told me it was better to remain hidden. Of course, I don't know how well hidden a blue tent in the middle of the forest can be, but turning on a flashlight would be like activating a beacon for everything within a few miles to see. I sat in the dark for I don't know how long, feeling my heart pound through my chest loud enough that I was sure whatever was out there could hear it clearly. Thankfully, the smell eventually faded, but I was still so high on adrenaline that I knew I wouldn't sleep another wink for the rest of the night. Or so I thought. The following day, I awoke with Wendy cuddled in my arm, with one of her legs and arms draped over me, and once again, she was totally nude. Now, I was pretty sure she'd put on some pajamas before going to bed, but as she stirred and I got a good look at what was on display, I suddenly didn't care all that much. Eventually, she smiled lazily up at me and spoke. 
You sleep all right, city boy. You seem to have some pretty rough dreams in the middle of the night. At the time, those words made perfect sense. In the light of day, it seemed pretty clear that whatever happened last night was probably just a vivid dream brought on by the experiences of the day before and an unfamiliar environment. After a bit more time together, we decided to get up and tackle another day in the forest. However, when I finally crawled out of the tent, I could see our entire camp was in disarray. It was like something had gone through and tossed everything around. A few of the more delicate items were totally demolished. After a moment, I called out. Um, hey. You might want to take a look at this. As Wendy crawled out of the tent, she made a face. Must have been a bear. They usually don't come out this way, so I wasn't too worried about them. I guess that's on me, sorry. A bear, that kind of made sense. At least, I told myself so. As we were cleaning up, I even saw tracks, though, in my inexperience as a city boy, I would have said they belonged to a dog, not a bear. A huge dog. Maybe a wolf. What was even odder was when I found what looked like hoof prints. Looking at the prints, I realized that deer must be much bigger than they look on TV since they were more than twice as long as my hand. There isn't much more to say about the day. We fixed the place up, had breakfast, went on a hike, made dinner, and called it a night with a few other minor activities sprinkled throughout. I was back to enjoying the trip, so much so that I had mostly forgotten about the night before. But that night is when things took a bit of an unexpected turn. Once again, I awoke in the middle of the night. Thankfully, I wasn't alone this time, as Wendy was still asleep, half on top of me again. However, that stench was back and stronger than ever. It was amazing how bright it seemed in the tent. It must have been a full moon, or at least nearly full, because I could clearly see the shadow of a large deer pass between us and the night sky. But there was something wrong with this deer. It was clearly too tall, as if it was standing on hind legs, and when it opened its mouth, I could even make out a mouthful of very sharp teeth. I couldn't help it. I felt myself breathing more heavily by the second as my heart rate skyrocketed. My mind went blank when I suddenly felt Wendy stir. Remembering the presence of my considerably smaller girlfriend, I suddenly felt protective, as if I couldn't let anything happen to her. I was just about to tell her to be quiet when I noticed her looking up at me with a finger on her lips as if telling me to do the same. Then she whispered to me, stay in the tent, and started to get up. I don't know what I was thinking or if I was thinking. All I knew was I couldn't let Wendy go out to face whatever that was, so I reached out and grabbed her wrist before she could exit the tent. However, when she looked back at me, I released her immediately, almost as scared of her as whatever was outside the tent. Her eyes reflected light back at me like a cat's, and I could see the nails on her hand growing as I watched. In half a moment, she turned back around, opened the tent, and climbed outside. I will never forget the sound I heard at that moment. After I got home, I looked up the calls of a bunch of wild animals, and in hindsight, I'd say it was like a compilation of an elk call, a rabbit scream, and a mountain lion scream, but impossibly loud. Wendy shouted in answer, her tiny human voice sounding so frail in comparison. At least it did until it started to change, morphing and twisting into the howl of an impossibly large wolf. I couldn't help it. I peeked out the tent flap and standing in front of the tent was what I could only describe as a werewolf. 
The little five foot and change Wendy was now standing at least seven feet tall, covered in fur with claws and fangs that looked like they could tear through steel, and she looked ready for murder. Then, some movement on the opposite end of our camp drew my attention, and I witnessed a living nightmare that suddenly made a werewolf seem like less of a problem. It looked kind of like a deer if a deer had more articulated limbs far too long for its body. The feet ended in hooves, but the hands ended in long bony claws. The whole thing looked desiccated, its skin drawn so tight over its ribs and arms you could make out the skeleton beneath. The fur was spotty and looked partially rotted, with open holes leaking bodily fluids that should never see light. Its teeth were long and serrated, clearly meant for tearing rather than chewing. I sometimes hear hunters talking about deer being 8 or 10 points, but if I had to estimate, this thing had a 30-point antler, with many of the tines covered in what I suspected to be dried viscera from previous victims. The two monsters charged each other. The nightmare, which I now know was a wendigo, lowered its head, intending to impale its opponent, but at the last second, Wendy threw herself nearly flat on the ground, only to rock it up into the wendigo, latching onto its long neck with her powerful jaws while her hind feet kicked gouges into its vulnerable stomach. However, the wendigo didn't seem willing to give up that easily and tossed Wendy aside. She hit the ground hard and was soon set upon by the other monster. She raised an arm to defend herself, only for the wendigo to latch on with its own teeth, easily tearing through her skin and muscles. With a powerful kick, Wendy pushed the nightmare back, then started swiping at him over and over, making it loose ground. However, lowing its head, the wendigo charged forward again, and this time, Wendy wasn't fast enough as the wendigo caught her on his antlers and flipped her over his back, with new blood darkening the tips of the tines. But that was its downfall as Wendy sprung up and again latched onto its neck with her teeth, this time from behind. The nightmare struggled in vain, occasionally raking Wendy with his claws, but she refused to let go and began ripping and tearing her way through its neck until she grabbed hold of its antlers, and with one final jerk, the head came free. I don't have the heart to describe what came next, but let's just say the sound of flesh being torn and eaten is much more distinct through the thin membrane of a tent than a closed cabin window. Time passed. At least an hour, maybe two or three. It's hard to say for sure. I don't know what I expected to happen next, maybe I was going to be next, or perhaps I'd wake up from this nightmare, but eventually, the adrenaline passed, my eyes grew heavy, and I fell asleep again. When I awoke in the morning, I was alone this time. There was no sign Wendy had come back. I'd half hoped she'd still be here, telling me I'd had another nightmare, but I don't think I would have believed it again. It was kind of sad and lonely packing up our things by myself. I debated bringing Wendy's stuff with me, but I'm not that good of a hiker and wasn't confident I could pull it off, so I just left her things in her pack inside the tent. When I exited the tent, I was more than a little surprised to see Wendy sitting calmly by the fire pit with no wounds in sight. She smiled sadly. So, I guess I owe you an explanation. I remember hesitating, my mind blank, before I settled on the thought I had earlier. What, you're not going to try and convince me it was a nightmare again? She looked around at all the destruction in the campsite. Earth was kicked up, trees had claw marks gouged out, and there were signs of blood splatter everywhere. I didn't think I could convince you this time. I nodded as I looked around. Yeah, I guess not. Then, I looked back at her. You know, for a bit there, I was starting to think you were the monster eating people out here. Wendy pointed at herself, 
then laughed. Wait, me. Wendy the Wendigo. Don't you think that's a little too on the nose? I couldn't help it. As weird and messed up as everything was, as disturbing as everything I learned was, this was the Wendy I knew and cared for. So, I laughed with her, yeah, maybe so. Long story short, we're still together. Sure, my girlfriend might be a seven foot tall monster that eats other monsters for fun, but everyone has their quirks. Besides, dating is hard, and I'm happy where I am. Fifth story. This story was shared by you slash not underscore Luna. My terrifying encounter with a Canadian legend. Spoiler alert, it's not just a legend. Growing up in the remote wilderness of northern Canada, I always heard stories of the Wendigo. My grandfather told me tales of a creature so terrifying that even the bravest of men trembled at the mere mention of its name. But I never truly believed in the legend until one dark, snowy night. The whistling started faintly at first, like a haunting tune carried on the frigid wind. But it grew louder and more insistent like it was calling out to me personally. I tried to ignore it and kept hiking, but the whistling persisted, creeping closer and closer until I couldn't ignore it any longer. I peered into the darkness beside me and saw a figure standing in the woods. It was tall and thin, with skin stretched tightly over its bones, and its eyes glowed gray with a fierce hunger. I knew instantly what it was, the Wendigo. The instant I noticed it in the woods, it stopped whistling for a moment and twisted its head like it was intrigued that I had given in to its call. It began to whistle again, a melody so haunting that it seemed to penetrate my very soul. It was like it was trying to hypnotize me, to lure me into the woods where it could claim me for its own. I was paralyzed with fear, unable to move as it began to creep closer and closer. Its claws and teeth gleamed in the moonlight, and I knew that if it reached me, it would be the end. I turned to continue hiking, I just needed to get back to my cabin I told myself. But then, it started snarling. The whistling faltered for just a moment as I heard its footsteps thumping through the woods. I grabbed the knife my grandfather gave me as a boy from my bag ready to strike. When my grandfather gave me this knife he told me to always keep it close because it might just save my life one day. As soon as I heard the wendigo break through the tree line I threw it with all my might. It hit the creature square in the chest, and it let out a blood-curdling scream. It writhed in agony as I watched, frozen with terror. But then, to my horror, it began to change. Its skin began to peel away in strips, revealing a twisted and gnarled form underneath. Its limbs elongated and twisted into new shapes, its jaws unhinged to reveal rows of razor-sharp teeth. It was transforming into something even more monstrous than before. I turned and ran as fast as I could, my heart pounding in my chest. I could hear the wendigo behind me, its ragged breaths and pounding footsteps echoing through the trees. I struggled with all my might to get away, my feet slipping and sliding on the snow and ice. Just as I thought I wouldn't be able to escape, I heard a branch snap behind me. I didn't dare look back, but I felt in my stomach that the creature was still close behind. I pushed myself harder, running as fast as I could. I could see the lights of my cabin in the distance, a beacon of safety in the darkness. With a final burst of adrenaline, I threw myself through the door of my cabin and slammed it shut behind me. I leaned against the door, gasping for breath and shaking with fear. I could hear the wendigo outside, snarling and whistling. But my grandfather always told me they couldn't come inside as long as I kept the door locked. 
I stayed there for what felt like hours, too scared to move. But eventually, the snarling and whistling stopped, and I knew that the creature had moved on. I didn't manage to sleep that night, but hours after the sun came up, I carefully opened the door and went back outside and into the woods. I followed my own footsteps in the snow. The Wendigo's nowhere to be seen, as if it hadn't been stomping into the ground with what sounded like an earth-shattering force. About halfway to where I thought I had first seen the Wendigo, I found a tree. Mangled, split in half and laid out diagonally across the path, I realized this tree was how I was able to get away. Then I thought back to what my grandfather said about the knife. Maybe the knife made the tree get in the way. Maybe not. Either way, I never forgot that night. For years after that night, I lived in constant fear of the Wendigo's return. Every time the wind whistled through the trees, or a stray twig snapped in the woods, I would freeze, waiting for the sound of that haunting melody. Thanks a lot for watching the video till the end, subscribe to our channel Horror in Detail. Drop your opinions slash suggestions in the comments section, and like the video as it helps with the YouTube algorithm.